Ali Kashani joins us now here on the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange for a one-on-one, -on -one, kind of a one-on-one -on -one interview. He is the CEO of Serve Robotics. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks for having me. I said kind of a one-on-one -on -one interview because I think he actually brought a friend. I brought what is tell. this? Yeah, he's uh, one of our 2,000 robots now that are out there on the streets delivering food. You would order on Uber Eats or DoorDash, and one of these robots would show up bringing your food. This is absolutely awesome. Can you yeah. talk to me first and foremost? How does this work? If people were to see this in their local communities and they say, yeah. what is this thing? What is the answer? It's basically an autonomous delivery robot. And what it's supposed to kind of help with is really get rid of cars on the street that are delivering, you know, two pound burritos in two ton cars. Doesn't make any sense. Sure. It's unsafe. It, you know, it's, it's, it creates congestion, emissions. These robots are here to reduce our dependence on cars, basically. Okay, so this one is Montel. Yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit about the engineering, for the actual hardware yeah. that we're looking at? What goes into making this thing a reality? So imagine a self-driving car, but in a smaller form factor. It has all the same technologies. It has a sensor on top called LiDAR. Uh, it has cameras all around. It has, uh, you know, really powerful batteries and motors so that it can go on a sidewalk and not get stuck anywhere. And it has a lot of compute. It has NVIDIA chips inside. It can basically understand the world and decide where to go uh, most of the time by itself. And whenever it needs help, a human can step in and help. Ali, I have no doubt people are watching this interview saying, I want one of these to deliver my next burrito. What are the platforms that you're partnering with to make these a reality in communities across the US? Yeah, well, we are working with the two largest platforms in the country, both Uber Eats and DoorDash. And if you're in the right city, so we're in Los Angeles, we are in Miami, Dallas, Chicago, Atlanta, and as of uh, this week, we are in um, uh, Virginia as well, in Alexandria. So if you're in any one of those communities, and we cover, I think, about 3 million population right now where we are operating with the 2,000 robots. So you'll be able to open Uber Eats, place an, uh, place an order from, I think, more than 3,000 restaurants last I checked, and one of these robots would show up and deliver your food. Uh, as you mentioned, like your, one of your newest markets, Alexandria, Virginia. Yeah. Talk to me about what goes into establishing that relationship. I'd yeah. imagine there's local rules, regulations, and that's different from contending yeah. with a city the scale of Los Angeles. That's right. I mean, it's a lot of work that goes into this. From one of my colleagues who is actually right here with me, Ryan, who goes to these new markets before anybody. He makes sure that the market is ready for us. He actually talks to the merchants. He talks to the platforms. We have a policy team that engages the cities first. We never go to any city unless we've actually talked to the policymakers. By law, our robots are usually allowed to operate everywhere, but we still want to engage them and make sure that we are partnering with them. And then once everything is set up, we bring the robots. From the user experience, if I were to order my burrito or the food that I really want in this thing, how do I know that it's going to come securely and that no one else might sort of intercept yeah. Montel yeah. on the way to my apartment doorstep? Well, it's locked. So the only person who can access it is you on the phone app. You press the button on your Uber Eats, let's say, and it would lo unlock for you. Otherwise, no one else can get your food. What, how important is the user feedback component to your earlier iterations of a machine like this? And how have you and the company taken in that feedback into account to continue to iterate yeah. the process? Look, I think it's very clear that robots are the future. But the thing that, that I think we need to really pay attention to is the acceptance by the users, by society as a whole. So we really have three kinds of users. We have the people who order their food. We have the merchants who you know, actually provide the food. And everybody else on the sidewalk that walks by a robot that's just, you know, minding their own business and suddenly there is a robot right there. So we actually designed for all three. We want to make sure we're mindful of everybody. On the sidewalks, you have people on wheelchairs. You have people who might be deaf or blind. So you have to actually incorporate all of those inputs and make sure that what you're designing is thoughtful for everybody. So we spent now eight years designing these robots to really work for everybody. Can you talk to me a bit about the delivery categories that you and the team have found to be more popular than others, specifically using this type of very unique and very cool delivery system? Yeah. I mean, we have, the bin inside here is fairly large. You can fit, put, uh, you know, fit six large pizzas. You can put in two large grocery bags. Uh, you could do pharmacy. You could do parcels. But at the end of the day, hot food is the number one application because we eat three times a day. So it, it makes a lot of sense. But we've done uh, groceries. We've done you know, convenience goods. Uh, a lot of times right now, you want to order something. You just need, like I don't know, a ketchup. Now you have to order $30 worth of stuff just to get the ketchup. And guess what? It shows up and the ketchup was missing. They didn't have it, right? <laughs> With the robots, we bring that cost of delivery, which is about $10, I think, in, in the major markets today. 
from a ten dollar to a dollar for with the robot. Now you can just order the ketchup. You don't need to order everything else. So it's actually much more efficient. It's better for users, better for merchants. Ali, talk to me before I let you go a bit more about the sensor stack. You mentioned the LiDAR radar components here on top yeah. and the other ways that you and the company are leveraging AI to even improve yeah. what you already have. Yeah, I mean, look, robots are embodied AI. That's, that's basically what, what they are. There's a, there's a machine, but then everything else is really building that AI that can look at the sensor data, understand what's going on, and then you know, navigate its path. It starts with that LiDAR on top. It's a very advanced sensor that's come down in cost a lot. It's actually by one of our close partners, Alster. Uh, we have cameras. We have uh, actually other types of like stereo cameras and time of flight cameras over there. Um, so the robot ultimately is very aware of its surrounding. And then it uses those NVIDIA chips that I mentioned to actually process all that information and make decisions. And talk to me about what the roadmap for 2026 looks like for you and the company with now uh, such a, a record number, at least for your company, of delivery vehicles like this. Yeah, let me actually tell you about 2025 first. We started with 100 robots. We have scaled it to 2,000 as of today, which is why I'm here. And we've taken it from a single market, which was Los Angeles, to six markets now. I mentioned Dallas, Chicago, Miami, Atlanta, and, and uh, Alexandria. So we are going to scale more. We are going to put. Uh, we are going to go to more neighborhoods, involve more uh, platforms, and more cities and more uh, merchants. And uh, we'll talk more about the scaling up the robots hopefully in the future. Ali Kashani is the CEO of Serve Robotics. Montel, the star of the show. Thank you both. <laughs> Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us.